Okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, just before we begin, would someone open us in prayer, please? Okay. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your grace and mercy. Thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for uh, instilling that uh, desire to, to study and to learn your word and to know more about you and your kingdom, Lord. Lord, we ask you to bless this time. We ask you to uh, anoint our teacher that uh, she will... Uh, relay exactly what you have told her to, to relate to us and we ask you to give us the ability to retain the information that you're giving us uh, this morning we ask you to bless this time with us in jesus name amen thank you um so we want to do a full recap of everything we covered on monday uh, just because we need to try and um cover a little more today uh, we'll go back to the beginning of matthew we were uh, going over an outline of the book of matthew and um, this outline is based on looking at how matthew presents jesus as king so uh, how does that uh, presentation of jesus as king change through the whole book what are the different aspects of Jesus' King that uh, Matthew looks at? Uh, so that's what we began with on Monday. Uh, we'll just go back to the beginning to uh, do a quick look um, at some of the chapters we covered already. Um, again, if you all can keep your Bibles open, keep it at Matthew so that as we're looking at the outlines, if we want to look at specific stories, uh, we can do that um, and one of you can read. OK, so uh, beginning at Matthew 1.1. Uh, 1, 1. So it begins with the presentation of the king. So Matthew begins with a genealogy um, telling us about uh, how uh, Christ, so Jesus' lineage, right? Uh, beginning right from Abraham, so showing Jesus as uh, very much um, Jew, right, a descendant of Abraham, and then uh, right up to Joseph. So he presents Jesus as in uh, born in the lineage of David. So that was the uh, proof of the fact that he was the Messiah because the Messiah would come from the line of David. Um, <clears throat> from there, uh, we go into uh, the birth of Jesus. Uh, so there's a birth narrative and then um, the visit of the wise men to King Herod. Uh, Jesus, I mean, the family's flight into Egypt. Um, Herod killing the children. Now, again, here we see that um, similarity between Moses's birth and the killing of the Jewish children or the Hebrew children. Uh, when Moses was born, uh, and here when Jesus is born, there's um, again the killing of all male uh, children below the age of two. Um, and then Jesus returns to Nazareth once King Herod dies. Um, we then have the announcer of the king, so that's where John the Baptist comes in. Uh, we have an introduction to John and an introduction to his ministry. Uh, that points to Jesus' coming and the establishment of uh, the kingdom of heaven. And uh, that's how Matthew refers to the kingdom of God. He refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. Um, <clears throat> then from John the Baptist, it moves to uh, Jesus himself uh, coming in. And uh, that section is summarized as the approval of the king. Um, so we have the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, um, and um, and then we come into the second 
uh, section of Matthew, which is the proclamation of the king. Uh, here is where we see one of those five sermons that we talked about. So there's the introduction to the sermon and then the actual sermon on the mount. Um, part three is the power of the king. Um, here we see some of Jesus' miracles and then um, a little bit about discipleship. So what it means to be a disciple. Uh, and uh, what Jesus is asking of those who follow him. Um, and then Jesus sending out the disciples to do the same ministry that he's been doing. Uh, he sends them out to continue that ministry. So the sending of the 12. Um, in part four, I think we just uh, came to the beginning of this uh, section. So this is where. Um, from seeing Jesus uh, being presented by John the Baptist, Jesus being approved by the Father, uh, Jesus beginning to teach, we start to see how people respond to Jesus's ministry. Uh, and we see that there is a progressive rejection. So there are different groups of people who start to reject uh, Jesus as the king. Um, and uh, so here we see John the Baptist who questions whether Jesus is truly the Messiah when he's in prison. Um, and then uh, there are different other groups of people uh, that we look at. And it ends with Jesus inviting uh, those who are weary to come to him. So we'll continue from there, chapter 12, Matthew chapter 12. Let's just turn to Matthew 12. Um, and here we see where the Pharisees themselves, uh, which right through the Gospels, uh, we see the Pharisees have never accepted Jesus's ministry. And so uh, we uh, this section is focusing on the rejection of Christ by the Pharisees. Uh, so uh, beginning with some of the their laws that um, Jesus and his disciples are not following, uh, which is uh, working on the Sabbath, healing on the Sabbath, uh, and then uh, their response to Jesus, uh, Jesus and what he says uh, when they question him. Let's just look at that. Chapter 12, uh, verse 13. Um, so, uh, the Pharisees ask in chapter 12, verse 10, does the law permit a person to work by healing on the Sabbath? They were hoping he would say yes, so they could bring charges against him. And then Jesus, of course, heals this person. And then in verse 14, it says, the Pharisees called a meeting to plot how to kill Jesus. So um, Jesus not following the rules that the Pharisees had laid out as uh, essential to the Jewish faith, uh, brought in um, their their anger, their um, their uh, plan to kill Jesus or to have uh, him taken out of the picture. So uh, from 14 to 21, there is a plan to destroy Jesus. Um, then 22 to 30 is where they blaspheme the Holy Spirit. They question Jesus' ministry as whether it is a ministry that uh, truly is by the Spirit of God or uh, whether he is casting out demons uh, by uh, the spirit of Beelzebub. And so um, that is uh, that is their blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. And then uh, 31 to 37 is where they commit the unpardonable sin. This is uh, this is where Jesus talks about blaspheming against the Holy Spirit and uh, says that that is a sin that will not be forgiven. Um, the Pharisees then demand a sign for Jesus to prove that he is the Messiah. And then Jesus talks about who his true family is uh, in the end of chapter 12. So uh, we continue to see, um, OK, I think this title here is wrong. Uh, or 
OK, I think it's the right title. It's uh, we continue this progressive rejection of the king uh, in chapter 13, uh, where Jesus begins to speak in parables. And he talks about what uh, is the result of rejecting uh, him and uh, what will be the consequences for those who reject him. And so this is uh, this. Um, one of the big sermons in Matthew as well. Um, and so here Jesus speaks to multitude. He speaks to his disciples. Um, and then uh, we see this last section of part four, where he's rejected by his own uh, people, right, in Nazareth, uh, where he's from. Uh, he's rejected by Herod. He's rejected by the scribes and Pharisees. And finally, by the Pharisees and Sadducees. Um, so let's just uh, look um, a little closer at chapter 16. OK, so we see uh, the Pharisees and Sadducees in chapter 16 are asking for a sign, for Jesus to show a sign uh, to prove his authority. And uh, Jesus. Uh, replies that the only sign that will be given is the sign of Jonah. Uh, and then after this is where he uh, says to beware of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So he's telling his disciples to beware of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Uh, we see Peter declaring Jesus as the son of God. Um, and then Jesus uh, talking about his death, uh, telling them that he will die at the hands of the Jewish leaders. Um, so even in all of this, like we talked about earlier, that uh, the Gospel of Matthew is written to Jewish Christians, right? So when Matthew is um, talking specifically about the Pharisees, um, he is basically saying that these were the these are the Jewish leaders or were the Jewish leaders uh, during Jesus's uh, time of ministry, and they didn't recognize Jesus as uh, the Messiah. They rejected Jesus as the Messiah. So even as you are uh, being rejected by the Jewish community, right? The Jew, uh, the Jews who believed in Jesus were rejected by the rest of the Jews who had rejected Jesus. Uh, they also rejected the disciples of Jesus, all those who began to follow him. And so um, this, uh, when we are looking at this outline and looking at Matthew's presentation of the Jewish leaders, uh, it's an encouragement to these Jewish Christians to say, um, this is to be expected. If they rejected Jesus, they are going to reject you. And um, and he ends finally in Matthew 24 with that uh, final judgment on the temple itself, right? So uh, where God himself is going to judge these Jewish leaders and the Jewish establishment uh, for their rejection of Jesus. Uh, so. Matthew is through all of this. Um, he's presenting to the uh, Jewish Christians uh, the truth of the fact that they are going to experience rejection, but Jesus also experienced rejection. And so they can be encouraged uh, that whatever they have believed is true and they can continue to walk in it. Uh, and they can depend on Jesus just as Jesus overcame, they can also overcome uh, through Jesus. Um, so from there, we go to uh, the fifth section of Matthew. Uh, this is the preparation of the disciples, um, chapter 16 to chapter 20. So uh, let's just, uh, th that's what we talked about, where Peter declares Jesus as king and uh, Jesus as the son of God. And then Jesus um, affirms what Peter has said, but then goes on to talk about his suffering. Um, and then from there, uh, we see that um, there are certain instructions that Jesus gives to the disciples uh, to prepare them uh, because uh, because they are going to be living without him anymore, 
right? They are going to continue to live out this faith. Uh, they continue going to continue this ministry, and Jesus will not be um, be there in their midst. And so he teaches them about faith. He talks about his own death. Uh, he talks about taxes, humility, uh, forgiveness, divorce, uh, different things about how uh, to continue to walk in obedience to him and uh, what, what it means to be a disciple. Uh, part six of uh, this book uh, is uh, where uh, Jesus comes uh, for public uh, judgment, right, uh, where his, his sentence is officially given. Uh, it begins with uh, Jesus healing the blind man and the blind man coming to faith. And we see here uh, a contrast between a physically blind person who is healed and recognizes who Jesus is versus the Jewish leaders who claim to be spiritually, uh, who claim to have their eyes open spiritually. But in truth, they are blind spiritually, and they are not able to see uh, Jesus as the Messiah. Uh, so it begins with that. Uh, and showing their spiritual blindness then uh, continues into how they respond to Jesus and finally condemn him to death. Um, so. Jesus comes into Jerusalem. So we see the triumphal entry. We see the cleansing of the temple. Uh, we see how Israel as a nation rejects uh, Jesus. So the cursing of the fig tree, the conflict with the priests and elders, conflict with the Pharisees, conflict with the Sadducees, and continued conflict with the Pharisees here. Uh, in response, Jesus then um Jesus pronounces judgment over the nation. So he talks about the Pharisees, he condemns them, and he then laments over Jerusalem itself. Uh, so maybe if someone can just read those last two verses, um, Matthew 23, 37 to 39. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 23, verse 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have ga uh, gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings? And you would not see your houses left to you desolate, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thank you. So um, we see here Jesus' final pronouncement of judgment over uh, Jerusalem. And then it goes into uh, the, uh, talking about the end times, beginning with the destruction of the temple. Uh, right, we know that the temple was destroyed in AD 70, uh, and so um, that uh, was seen as a fulfillment of what was said here. Uh, now, because we don't know the exact date of uh, Matthew's writing, we don't know if he wrote post this, the destruction of the temple or before the destruction of the temple, um, but we see that what Jesus had said about the temple actually happened here. Um, and then um, uh, Jesus begins to answer some of the questions of the disciples. And they want to know what is, what's going to happen at the end times, when it's going to happen. Uh, so he starts to tell them more about what to expect at the end. Um, then we go into the passion narrative uh, in chapters 26 to 27, uh, the plot to kill Jesus. Mary anointing Jesus, that is, uh, with the jar of alabaster. Um, Judas agreeing to betray Jesus. Um, the celebration of the Passover. Jesus being arrested. Jesus' trial, his crucifixion, and burial. Um, 
And then we come to the last chapter in Matthew, which is where Jesus is proved to be the king that uh, Matthew has presented throughout uh, the gospel, um, starting with the empty tomb, uh, the appearance of Jesus to the women, uh, the bribery of the soldiers, the appearance of Jesus to the disciples, and finally the Great Commission to take this gospel to the ends of the earth. So uh, while that gospel is presented to the Jews um, during Jesus' ministry and uh, even by this gospel, uh, the reminder that this gospel is then to be taken to the Gentiles as well. Uh, so with that, we come to the end of the outline on the book of Matthew. Is there anything you wanted to uh, bring up on anything we covered during this outline? Any questions or any thoughts? OK. We continue from here. And I just want to encourage you, um, as we are covering all of these books, uh, to try and do a quick reading through the book so that as we are um, as we're talking about different points in the book, uh, you have fresh in your memory what the book talks about. So we cannot go into detail um, into the content of each book. Uh, so if you are reading it on your own time, then when we come here, we can just summarize it and you'll be able to connect the dots between the summary and what, um, what you have read. OK, so. <clears throat> Um, we're going to just look at uh, some of the things that um, are talked about in Matthew and then some of the things that the whole of the New Testament talks about uh, that is also mentioned in the book of Matthew. Um, so Matthew talks about the virgin birth. Um, this is something that uh, is sometimes questioned, uh, especially from uh, the perspective of um, science or just natural thinking how can a virgin uh, give birth to a baby like how does how is that even possible um, but we see uh, matthew and luke very clearly talk about the fact that uh, mary is a virgin and uh, that um, that when she is promised uh, that she will have a baby um, she responds saying, I'm a virgin, how will I have this child? Uh, so that word for virgin uh, is clearly referring to the fact that she has not uh, engaged in any sexual intercourse. That it's not um, to mean that she's unmarried, uh, right? Because of the context in which uh, it's said. So let's just turn quickly to Matthew 1, 18 to 23, and we'll read that. If someone can read that for us. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they became before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Thank you. You can go on till uh, verse 23. 19. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Uh, you can go on till verse 23, please. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. 23. Behold, 
the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Thank you. So um, we see here clearly uh, mention of the fact that Mary was still a virgin. She hadn't yet married Joseph, uh, right? And um, also that this is a fulfillment of a prophecy that was spoken in the Old Testament, that's in Isaiah 7, 14, uh, that the virgin will conceive uh, and will give birth to a son. Um, we'll also look at Luke 1, 31 to 35, if someone can read that. Luke 1, uh, 31 to 35. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be? Since I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Thank you. Um, so, yes, in Matthew and Luke, we see clearly uh, pointing to the virgin birth, and uh, we see in Isaiah 7, 14, and then 9, 6 to 7, uh, the prophecies about uh, 7, 14, the prophecy of Jesus being uh, born uh, by a virgin, or the Messiah being born by a virgin, and 9, 6 to 7, um, that uh, that child that is given uh, will be a divine child. So we see uh, the description as um, as he will be called Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and his kingdom will have no end, right? Uh, so if we can quickly turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, if someone can read that for us. Isaiah 9, chapter 6 to 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. And his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Thank you. So um, in these two verses, we see a child will be born. It will be a son. Uh, he will be given authority uh, that he will be divine. He will be called mighty God, everlasting father, uh, that he will be from the line of David and that his kingdom will be eternal. Uh, so a lot of very specific descriptions of uh, this child that is to be born. And we see all of that uh, being um, being spoken about Jesus before his birth, right? Um, and uh, fulfilled through his birth. Uh, so that is the first thing where uh, the virgin birth is clearly spoken about in scripture and fulfilled um, the prophecy is fulfilled in the New Testament. Um, the second thing is repentance. So um, just uh, when Matthew talks about repentance, when we see uh, that call to repentance, if someone can read Matthew 3, 8 for us. Matthew 3, 8, therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. 
Yes. So uh, we see both John the Baptist and Jesus calling people to repentance. Uh, so repentance was not simply feeling uh, sorry for your sin. It was to see um, a complete change in your heart and a change in the way you were living. Uh, so what we saw in verse 8 here, uh, that the way you live should be a way that is in line with God's will. Uh, and so you've turned from sin and you've turned to live a life uh, in obedience to God. Um, Ezekiel 18, 21 also gives us a very clear description of what repentance looks like. If someone can read that uh, for us. Ezekiel chapter 18, 21. But if a wicked person turns away from all his sins, that he has committed and keeps all my statutes, and does what is just and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Thank you. So this is a very clear description. So when we say uh, repent and turn to God, uh, when um, that was the message that was uh, being preached, this is what repentance is, what uh, Ezekiel 18, 21 talks about. Uh, it is to turn away from your sins, to obey God, to do his will, to do what is just and right. And that will uh, that is proof of true repentance. Um, then we see in Matthew uh, preaching on the kingdom of heaven, right? Uh, so uh, Matthew uh, talks about the kingdom of heaven versus the kingdom of God that is used in the other gospels. Now there's no difference between those two. The kingdom of heaven is the kingdom of God. Um, he just uses different language and again uh, because of his jewish audience uh, the kingdom of heaven would resonate with them um now jews uh, knew that god ruled over the universe in the present they uh, knew that he was in control but they were also praying for a day when the whole world would turn to follow uh, to follow God, that they would turn away from idolatry, they would turn away from disobedience uh, and uh, come to know the one true God. Um, and so when they were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah, like we read in Isaiah, that uh, that rulership was going to be eternal and it was not going to be limited to Israel, right? So. Um, so they were looking forward to the coming of the Messiah for that. So when the kingdom of heaven is being proclaimed here, uh, that is the idea within the minds of the Jews. Um, while there is also a sense of a political uh, breaking free when they think of the Messiah, uh, they had this picture of the kingdom of heaven uh, or the kingdom of God uh, as uh, fulfillment of that promise that God himself would rule uh, and all people would be under his rule. So that coming kingdom was what they were looking forward to. Um, so if we can just look at these two passages that I mentioned here, Acts 1, 6 and Ephesians 1, 21 to 23. Can I read, sister, Acts 1, 6? Yes, please. Uh, therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Thank you. So here we see uh, that this was the mindset uh, that uh, the kingdom would be where Israel was freed from uh, foreign rule and they would once again be able to have their own um, own people ruling over them. So that was one view of the kingdom that they had. Uh, so we can just read Ephesians 1, 21 to 23. Ephesians chapter 1, 21 to 23. Yeah, please go ahead. No, please go ahead, sister. Thank you. For above all rule and authority, and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet, 
and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Thank you. So Ephesians gives us a picture of what that kingdom is. While uh, while the Jews were looking forward to that uh, physical, that political restoration, uh, Ephesians talks about uh, this rulership that is present, like Christ reigns right now over all creation, uh, and to eternity, uh, right? Uh, and so as a as people who belong to the kingdom of God, uh, this is um, the blessing that we are invited to, that we reign with Christ, um, and that uh, the benefits of Christ ruling over all things uh, are ours to experience even now. Um, so um, what does it mean to be in the kingdom of God, to be in the kingdom of heaven? Uh, it means that we are experiencing the presence of Jesus. Uh, we're walking in relationship with him. We're walking in obedience to his rule personally. And then we are um, living out uh, what it means to be his children in the way we do live our daily lives. Uh, so we are establishing that reign of Jesus in the things that we are doing. So the we are living with uh, his justice, his righteousness, uh, his uh, will being the guiding principle in all the things that we are doing. Uh, and so uh, we experience his kingdom here and now while we look forward to his final coming back where that kingdom will be fully established and realized um, at his second coming. So with that, we go into another aspect, uh, another thing that Matthew talks about, which is the Lord's Prayer. Uh, now, we are looking at the Lord's Prayer and then what it means uh, on the other side um, is what it means in the kingdom of God. Uh, so. The Lord's Prayer begins with our Father. That means we have a personal relationship with God as people who are in his kingdom. Um, our Father in heaven. So recognizing that he rules over all, um, that he is the king and all power belongs to him, like we read in Ephesians. Um, hallowed be your name. So we honor him as uh, one who is reigning and is powerful and continues to have control over all uh, all of creation. Uh, your kingdom come, right? So we are surrendering ourselves, submitting our situations, our circumstances to his rule. Um, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, so uh, the, just a continuation of that. So submitting our will to him uh, as we live on this earth, that we live in obedience to his will. Uh, give us this day our daily bread, uh, recognizing that God supplies all our needs, our daily needs. Uh, forgive us our debts as we also forgive. So we are people who have been forgiven, and we are people who live uh, forgiving lives, so lives that uh, express the forgiveness that we ourselves have received. Um, and then lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So even as we are uh, continuing to walk uh, in this kingdom of God uh, and continuing to uh, be people who uh, seek to establish God's kingdom in the world around us, uh, we recognize that we uh, are uh, we are facing spiritual battles, and so we are praying. Um, that God would protect us in those battles, um, that we would um, be delivered from all evil, uh, and we ourselves would not fall into temptation as we, um, are, we are, as we are establishing his kingdom. So uh, just to look at this prayer in line with Matthew's theme of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, so what does that prayer mean for how we live as kingdom people? Um, so with that, we come to the end of 
some of the specific things that Matthew talks about. But uh, here we're looking at what does Matthew talk about that also the rest of the New Testament uh, continues to build on. Um, uh, so we'll uh, talk about a few of these things. Uh, one is the miracles in the New Testament. Uh, we see the miracles mentioned uh, especially in the Gospels, but also uh, in the early church. Um, there were two purposes to those miracles. One was that it proved that Jesus had come from God, right? So when Jesus was ministering, uh, he was able to prove his power and authority uh, through the miracles he was doing. So whatever he was saying uh, could be taken seriously because the power of uh, and his power and authority were being seen in the miracles that he was doing. Um, at the same time, we see in Moses's ministry when Moses was sent to the people uh, of uh, to the to the Hebrew people, God uh, enabled him to do certain miracles to prove that he had been sent by God himself. Uh, so that same idea here with Jesus, when he comes in, that the miracles uh, prove who he is, prove that God himself has sent him. Uh, the second purpose of the miracles is uh, that it uh, reveals uh, God's will for people, right? Uh, so didactic means that it is meant to teach people something about uh, something that God wanted to teach them. Uh, and in this case, the miracles wanted uh, uh, was was to prove that uh, God cares about uh, the state of all creation, but specifically about uh, people, right? The suffering of people. So we see uh, a lot of miracles that are related to nature, but the majority of the miracles that are seen in the Gospels are related to people. So the to um, see people freed from uh, demonic oppression, to see people freed from sickness, from uh, from suffering, uh, one kind or another. So to show that God really cares about the suffering of people and he seeks to free people, he desires to free people uh, from uh, the suffering that they are experiencing. So what does that mean for us today? When we look at the miracles in the New Testament, uh, we see these two purposes in the miracles that were being presented. But what does it mean for us today as kingdom people? Uh, one is we, uh, while miracles do prove uh, the power of Jesus' name, uh, we don't have to only uh, use miracles to prove that. Miracles... Um, can uh, also uh, teach people uh, miracles continue to be things that we experience because God continues to be a be one who cares about the uh, sufferings of people, right? Like we see in the New Testament, he cared about the sufferings of people. That was not just in the New Testament. He continues to be a God who wants to see people delivered and healed and redeemed. Um, and because we are part of the church, uh, we no longer need miracles to prove to us uh, that Jesus is who he says he is. Uh, because we can go to his word, we have already experienced him personally. So miracles are not required as proof of who Jesus is. Um, we can just examine his word and see what he desires, what he wills, and see whether things are in line with his word. Um, but we can continue to experience healing because God is still a God who cares about our present day sufferings, uh, the things that we carry, the burdens that we carry. Um, and so that is uh, how we can continue to see miracles being, uh, being uh, experienced in the church and in our lives today. Um, on demons in the New Testament. So um, the Greek term actually um, doesn't have a very specific meaning, the Greek word daimon. Uh, it is used for all kinds of spirits, so different kinds of spirits. Um, but on the other hand, um, the Jews uh, who were not so influenced by Greek thought, they viewed um, 
they viewed demons as uh, spirits that were not um, not submitted to God. So spirits other than angels that were not submitted to God. So they were hostile to God's people. Um, we'll read uh, these passages that are mentioned here. If we have the time, we have a few minutes. Um, but that's how it was understood as, uh, by the Jews, it was understood as uh, spirits that were not submitted to God and were uh, hostile to God's people. Um, in Mesopotamian culture, they were viewed as, um, as uh, spirits that lived in a dark world and were causing human misfortune. Okay, and um, so uh, when we see Jesus' ministry and specifically Jesus uh, um, freeing people from demonic, um, demonic oppression, uh, we see Jesus coming directly against these spiritual powers uh, that were already known in that culture, but in Jesus' ministry, it's especially highlighted. Uh, so let's just read Matthew 12, 27 to 29, if someone can read that for us. Matthew 12, 27 to 29. And if I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can one enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds that, the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? Thank you. So the exorcists uh, at that time, uh, they used uh, different kinds of magical formulas. Uh, they used uh, things like um, um, a, a lot of like witchcraft, those kinds of things. Uh, so there were things like stinky roots that they would use. They would use uh, things like that to uh, free people from demons. Um, but here Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God coming and where the kingdom of God has come, there is no place for anything that is not uh, in submission to, to this king, right? And so there must be um, everything that is not in submission being removed. And so he says, uh, he talks about how he has come to take hold of uh, to free people uh, from Satan. So he says, um, if I'm casting out, then the kingdom of God arrived uh, among you, verse 29, who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan. So to say that until now, Satan had control over, uh, over you all, over this region. But now uh, I've come in, the kingdom of God has come here. And so um, Satan no longer can have a hold here. So someone greater has come in. Uh, and so that is the relevance for us today, uh, to say that Jesus is greater. So even if um, and when we come across uh, demonic powers, there is no reason to be afraid. There's no reason uh, to uh, wonder, um, are, we, are we in danger if there is a if there is any demonic power around us, uh, because Jesus has already overcome and we uh, share in his kingdom. Uh, we are his children. Uh, we share his authority. Uh, we also can overcome and we can uh, go against demonic powers with that confidence that Jesus is stronger, like verse 29 says. Um, For who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. Um, so we'll close with that for today. Um, I think we are out of time. Uh, if we have any questions, uh, we can start on Monday's class with those questions. Thank you all for joining um, today's class. Um, I did have an assignment for you all, actually. I don't know if that's in the next section. Yes. OK, I'll just post this on Google Classroom uh, because I didn't want to cover this in class. Um, I just wanted all to read through the parables in Matthew 13. Uh, 
uh, to look at what were the expectations of people regarding the kingdom versus what Jesus taught about the kingdom. Uh, and then we'll discuss that in class on Monday. That's on February 5th. OK, so I'll post this on Google Classroom as well, just for your reference. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, sister. Bye.